welcome to Sounds Heal Podcast. I am your host, Natalie Brown, and thank you for joining me as we continue to go into these fields of sound therapy, sound healing, and using sound for health and wellness. I heard of our guest today through John Beaulieu, who I interviewed a couple months back for this podcast, but I was actually at John Beaulieu's Cranial Sacral Therapy and sound healing training in California a couple years ago, and he mentioned this brand new textbook called Nutrition and Integrative Medicine, a Primer for Clinicians, that has different papers, different articles for clinicians. Beaulieu and David Perez Martinez had uh, a chapter, chapter 19, in this textbook called Sound Healing Theory and Practice. So this is Integrative Medicine Textbook. So that's the first time I heard of David Perez Martinez was through his work with John Beaulieu. And then, of course, in the podcast with John, uh, John brought up David's name many times. And then you will also hear David mention John's name many times in this podcast as well. So they're colleagues. And based on, on John's work, I was really interested in talking with David Perez Martinez. David is an integrative psychiatrist and sound therapy practitioner. He integrates standard psychiatric care with mindfulness meditation, breathing exercises, cognitive behavioral therapy, and sound therapy techniques. He's been in private practice in New York City since 1995, and his work with sound dates back to the 70s when he started a music therapy workshop that used the human voice as the primary therapeutic instrument for self-awareness, empowerment, and healing. He's a lifelong musician. He has a background of anthropology and ethnomusicology. And as you'll see, he has an interesting perspective, a mix of traditions, practices, and trying to bring a balance of Western medicine and Eastern philosophies and practices. What I really loved was his articulation of how an individual's consciousness is the key factor to creating the healing response. Many people believe that we are in a time of great change, and with these shifts and the coming shifts, People like David will be leading the academic community to a much greater realization of reality. Please enjoy this conversation with Dr. David Perez Martinez. I know that you are integrating sound as a psychotherapist, but maybe we can trace back to explore your your sound journey. If you know you grew up in using music and studying music. And kind of everything before what you do now. Right. I should just clarify, though, I am a psychotherapist, but I'm a psychiatrist. Okay. Um, I, I, I do therapy, you know, with my, uh, with, with, with my patients, but, I, you know, but I'm a psychiatrist, essentially. And mm-hmm. That's what I, um, you know, what, what I integrate it with. Um, I would say this, you know, I've been a musician all my life pretty much since I was a teenager. Uh, as far back uh, as far back as I can remember, the first thing that I ever thought that I wanted to be was to be a singer. Um, I was standing in front of the mirror, you know, and I had my favorite singers and I would try to sing, you know, like them. Um, and then I started playing music and I've been playing music all my life. And then when I went to school, I studied anthrop. I was an anthropologist before I was a medical doctor. And I have a master's degree in anthropology. I dropped out of a doctoral program to, to, uh, to study public health and then, and then medicine. But as an anthropologist, I did a lot of work in ethnomusicology. I don't know if you know what that field is. Yes. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, I traveled with an ethnomusicologist in West Africa and South America publish about eight records so we're very much interested in in learning uh, about music from all over the world and listening to I spent my whole uh, adult life listening to music from all over the world that's pretty much what I listen to you know I've now I've lost track of a lot of the pop music 
because uh, I, I just don't have the, the time, you know, or the energy, you know, to to pursue it in that way. And then I, I worked in this at the same time when I was a graduate student in, in anthropology at the New School for Social Research in, in New York City. Um, I worked there with a man named Michael Harner, who is a pretty famous anthropologist who became a shaman. Mm-hmm. Um, and he, I worked with him on shamanism. He trained me, and then I eventually, you know, taught the, the graduate seminar in shamanism with him. And he actually ended up pretty much quitting anthropology and then spending his time traveling all over the world doing shamanic workshops where you do a lot of drumming and that. But at the same time, I used to work in this place in New York City called The Door, which was a comprehensive um, social service and healthcare agency for adolescents and for, for young people, which became a very famous place also. And, and we exported that model to different countries in the world. And in that place, I once had the idea that I wanted to do a, a voice workshop. Mm-hmm. And my idea was that, you know, the voice is a great instrument to for you to tune yourself and to figure out where you're at emotionally um, and to use it as a healing thing. So I, I came up with this idea and I went to my supervisors and I told them I wanted to do this. And they said to me, oh, well, great, sounds great. Why don't you write up something about it and submit it to us, you know, so we can all consider it. So I sat down and I wrote a set of principles um, about the voice and, and and how he and you could use it as a healing tool, um, and I gave it to them, and they they approved it. And one day there was another person who worked in the center. There was you know quite a few employees there. She came to me and she says, "Hey, you know I didn't know you were a music therapist. You know I heard about the workshop you want to do. I want to be a part of it." And I said, "No, I'm not a music therapist." She goes, oh, then you must have, you know, studied with somebody. I said, no, I didn't. And she said, oh, then you read so-and-so. I said, never heard of those people. (laughs) And she was mentioning the leading theorists in the field. And she looked at me like almost incredulous. Like she goes, really? (laughs) You just came up with these ideas you didn't read? Because these are the, you know, the major ideas of the field, you know. And, And she trained as a music therapist with, Uh, at Bennington in in Vermont Mm -hmm. and she studied there with uh, a jazz musician who was a he's much more than that you know he was a great drummer and he and he ran a a, a program there Um, and his name is Milford Graves you know I consider him a very important avant-garde jazz musician and and uh, so she said well you just came up with that I said yes you know it all came intuitively So I started that workshop and I did it for three years. And what I loved about that was that the kids who were coming there, most of them, not most of them, all of them, they thought they were coming in to take like voice lessons or a singing class. That's what they thought they were doing there. But what I was doing there is trying to teach them how to use the voice and teach myself also in that way, because that was a learning experience for myself how to use the voice as a healing tool for themselves and as a way to also as a meditative tool because right around that time I started practicing meditation. Um, so that just evolved and eventually, you know, I ended up, I went to India and I spent a year living in India practicing yoga and I was doing a lot of chanting and pranayama, breathing exercises and all that. And I, I, I came back to to New York after a year, um, I ended up uh, dropping out of a doctoral program in anthropology, and and then I went to study public health at Columbia University. Then I dropped out of that and I went to medical school. And as soon as I began practicing medicine, I began using sound in my practice, and that was a, a, about 27 years ago. And for the longest time, for about um, over 10 years or so, I was just, you know, patients would walk into my practice and, you know, they see some, I started using singing bowls, Himalayan singing bowls, and also chanting with them and and teaching them breathing exercises and meditation in addition to medicating them. Mm-hmm. As a, 
as a physician. And, but I was totally disconnected from this whole sound healing community. Mm -hmm. I had never even heard of sound healing. And then one day my wife, who's an acupuncturist, she said, hey, honey, look, there's a little, uh, uh, there's a conference upstate New York, uh, sort of like, you know, where all these sound healers are, are going in there presenting every year. She goes, you should go there and, 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 and see if you can become, you know, and, a part of this community or see who these people are. They're doing, you know, stuff with sound sort of like, like you're doing. And I said, wow. Mm. So it turned out that I missed it by a weekend. Mm. <laughs> by the time she told me that it had happened and, and it was a conference that's, that's still being held actually at uh, Menla, mm -hmm. which is a Buddhist retreat upstate New York. And I said, okay, then, you know, they hold it once a year and I'll go up there the following year. So the following year I went in, I was about 12 years ago, I believe, 11 years ago. And, and I went to that conference and that's where I met John. Mm. And I heard several speakers there, but the only one that really um, stuck with me was John. Yeah. I, f I felt that a lot of the stuff that some of the other people were saying was kind of a little bit, you know, new agey kind mm -hmm. of nonsense, you know, stuff, Yeah, which is what, you know, it's my my big issue right now. There's just too much of that going out there. You know? mm. No, re no real substance. You mm. know, behind what we're doing here. Yeah. Um, I saw recently this guy was announcing he was doing a sound bath and he was he was claiming that he's going to open up people's chakras. Mm -hmm. You know, <laughs> like their their higher chakras and all that. I'm going to open that up for you, and you're going to you know, so on and so forth. So, I immediately began. Uh, collaborating with John um, and and for the first time in my life I actually received instruction in sound. everything I had always done was in purely intuitive and I find out actually that a lot of the things that mostly what I was uh, what people were teaching I was doing them already I just came to it on my own but John introduced me to his tuning forks and up to that point the only instrument that I really use other than the voice were Himalayan singing bowls. And then I started using the tuning forks. I started going to, John has like one or two retreats every year in his place upstate. Mm -hmm. um, and I started going to that and then collaborating with him. And then eventually I began presenting with him also. Um, and then I began expanding uh, the sound healing aspect of or, the, or, or the rather, I don't call myself a sound healer, or, or I don't even call it sound healing. I, I just call it therapeutic sound mm. um, practices, because that's what it is. I believe sound is therapeutic. You know, uh, we're not making any claims of cures about anything. So, I started uh, expanding my practice to the point where now I would say that easily around eighty percent of my patients um, I treat with sound as well as all the other modalities, you know, the, the, the traditional modalities that we use in psychiatry. You know, I do cognitive behavioral therapy with patients. I medicate them if they need that. And I give them tools um, so that they can rely less on medication and so that they can also get in touch with what they can do to heal themselves and to, you know, as opposed to thinking that I need to take a pill whenever I don't feel mm -hmm. like this or that. Um, and now, I mean, it gets to the point where once I introduce patients to sound work, that's pretty much what they want to do. Mm. You know, <laughs> they come in and, and we're talking, and after a while I could see it in their eyes. In their eyes it's like, okay, let's stop talking. You know, let's do some sound here, you know, uh, because they really enjoy that and, and they, they feel differently and transform when they leave the, the, the practice. And also, as a result of all this, um, I started then to actually do research, you know, and just going beyond just my own intuition. And for the last uh, 12 years or so, I've been doing a lot of research and reading, and I'm, I'm primarily interested, you know, as, as part of my anthropological training, I'm interested in the evolution of hearing, of sound. Um, and as part of my medical training, I'm, I'm interested in the in the neuroscience behind behind sound and and how our body is um, uh, designed, you know, for 
for sound um, and so on and so forth. So that's what I've been really researching and reading about all the time. Whenever I'm not in my office, I'm pretty much working at home. Um, and on Fridays, like today, the other days, now I, I change my schedule. I only work Monday to Thursday. Mm -hmm. And on Fridays, I spend all day researching in my mm -hmm. office and, and writing. Um, last year, we published, you know, John, and in, in, he invited me to write a chapter with him. He was invited to write a chapter in a medical text I'm sure he told you about. Yeah, yeah. Um, and we co-wrote a chapter on sound healing mm -hmm. uh, in this textbook. And now that textbook has been so um, successful that they asked uh, Dr. Aruna, the uh, editor, to do a second one. And she's asked us to do a second chapter on another aspect of sound, and that's what we're working on now. Oh, great, great. Um, that that one is going to be more focused on on, on the neurological or aspects and and consciousness, uh, which is the big uh, the big kahuna in all this is the consciousness. Mm -hmm. So that's pretty much where my you know my development has come um, and how it has evolved through time yeah. to you know to to where I'm at today. Mm. Well, it's really really cool, you know. Um just all that you've followed and all that you've explored through both music and ethnomusicology. Um, it's just really, really exciting that you've followed your passions is what's really happened. You've f followed different rabbit holes that have led you to where you are. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, the sound, I mean, has transformed my practice. You mm. know, I remember I was getting to a point where I was getting tired of, of the practice. It was mm. becoming a little bit uninteresting to me. Um, you know, because, you know, in, in any profession, you, 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 you basically do, a, most of what you do is just a few things, mm. pretty much, you know, you do it over and over. And I was getting a little bit bored, just, you know, it, it didn't feel that much challenging to me anymore. Mm. The only thing great about it was really my interactions with the people. That, that's, you know, that was the only thing that really, but once I, you know, fully, fully introduced sound into it. I mean, that's just changed everything. You know, I, I can tell you that every day I, you know, I, I, I dance my way home and I dance my way. I mean, I dance my way to my practice and I dance my way back home. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I, I never feel, um, I feel very excited every day coming in to do my work. Um, and it's a lot of fun for me to do it. Um, and I think, you know, my, my patients, you know, they, it's contagious to them, you know, and they love it. They like it. You know, we, we have a good time doing the work that we do as opposed to like the serious work and not that they're, that isn't part of it, you know, where, and by serious, I mean like intense work, you know, I treat people that are suffering, uh, that are in trouble, you know, it's not like just like fun and games, you know, I, and I deal with people with some very serious problems mm -hmm. you know, in that way. But, we make it fun and, you know, we enjoy doing the work, you know, that, that we do. And it's, so it's been beneficial for me as well as for my patients. And that's actually the way it should be because if, if you're working with people and you're always giving, 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 and, and, and you yourself are not growing from that, then, you know, you become one of those doctors that people tell me about that they go to, you know. It's just like okay, I got, I got to get out of here. You know, mm -hmm. As soon as they walk in. Yeah. Can you give any examples of how you apply sound with your patients? What do, what does that look like, or maybe some really interesting um, success stories? Well, I could talk about success stories, of course, but um, I think it's better if I just give you some example of, you know, of how I work, for mm -hmm. example. Um, first of all, right now, if you see a photograph of my office, um, you'll see that it's filled with all kinds of instruments. So, and I use everything. I use gongs, I use crystal and Himalayan singing bowls, tuning forks. I've begun to use harmonica now, which I use as a harmonium, um, somewhat, you know, to give it like a, a drone. A meditative state, um, but there's a 
a researcher in Columbia University, Richard Brown, him and his wife, they've, they've developed this breathing exercise. It's a five second breathing exercise. It's five seconds to breathe in and five seconds to breathe out. Um, and I've adapted that into my practice and I've taken that into, a, I, I use this, um, this app called Insight Timer. Mm -hmm. And I program it, you know, for a bell to go off every five seconds as a cue. So in a, in a typical session that I have, um, I'll, I'll put on the, uh, the five second uh, uh, app, right? I'll turn it on for them and for, I do 15 minutes. It should be 20 minutes, but for 15 minutes, I, I put it on and I have the person breathe. Um, you may or may not know, you know, that the, the breath controls the autonomic nervous system. Mm -hmm. So when you equalize the amount of time that you use to breathe in and that you use to breathe out, you essentially, you bring the autonomic nervous system into balance. And what that means to be in balance means that you don't have a predominance of a sympathetic or parasympathetic activity, but rather you're in the middle and the net result of that is that you feel calm and relaxed, but alert as opposed to real calm and relaxed. And you feel like you just want to go to sleep, right? Or the opposite where you feel really alert, you know, but you're really hyper kind of. So in a typical session now, I'll start people with that. And about five minutes after they start doing the breathing exercise, then I'll, I'll do a session on them either with tuning forks um, and I place them in different parts of the body uh, depending on what I want to achieve. But there are certain points that I always use and, and I always use points that, that try to stimulate the vagus nerve, which is the major parasympathetic nerve in the body, um, but also points in the sternum and in the sacrum that can activate the parasympathetic nervous system also. Um, so. I will do that or um, I'll play singing bowls for them. Um, we can chant together. And I like to do, just do, we chant and I like to just keep it, you know, I shouldn't even, maybe not even call it chanting, but more like toning, um, where we just repeat uh, uh, pure sounds in that way. So we could do that together. Uh, we do the breathing. And I'll typically spend the, the first 30 minutes, I'll spend talking to the patient, addressing the issues, doing some therapy with them, talking about medications, if they're on medications or not. And then we'll end the last half hour. I see all my patients for an hour, by the way. And, and then I'll spend the last half hour doing the sound. And then I have this gong, uh, this Korean gong, that's very powerful. And I, I like to end it by giving them like a little gong, uh, a little gong bath. I hate to use that term because it has some different connotation, but it's more like a gong massage mm -hmm. in that way and have them walk out in that way. So that's a typical uh, session that I do. What, what varies are the, the instruments that I may use and different places in the body where I may focus on. Um, I, I've also learned from John, who's a craniosacral guy, mm -hmm. to some craniosacral techniques. And, and while people are breathing, you know, I may also do some craniosacral manipulations on them. Um, and then I give them exercises. I give them all the app. I program it for them. Um, and I and I have them, uh, I help them to develop a practice because I... I make the point to them, you know, if you just do it when you come here, that's not enough. You you need to build a practice and do it on your own every day um, to make it more powerful. So that's a, a, a very typical session that I do. And, and I spend most of the day doing that. You know, so needless to say, you know, I, I, I spend most of my day <laughs> doing sound myself mm. because when they're breathing, I'm breathing. You know, when they're chanting, I'm chanting. When they're, we're toning together, we're doing all these things together. Uh, sometimes I feel, at times I have felt a little guilty. I feel like I, I'm getting more out of this than they are. Mm. You know? you know? 
almost like I'm, you know, in that sense. But um, so that's typically, you know, what I've been doing. Sometimes, you know, I I I like people out also, and and then I just perform for them. You know, I uh, I use a what I, I'm sure you're familiar with what uh, the shruti box. Yes. Yeah. Right. And I will use that, and I will just chant for them and and tone for them and do do very cheap. So like give them a little concert, you know, because I feel like that's what they need. Um, or I create my own drone with, with a harmonica and I'll like for like 10 minutes, I'll play the harmonica very, very slowly like that. It sounds like a harmonium almost mm -hmm. with the bowls. And I, and I live them out and I let them just receive. And sometimes that's what patients need. They just need to receive right. um, as opposed to doing something active sure. in that way. So that's that's pretty typical mm -hmm. of, of what I do, of what I do in, in my practice on a daily basis. And just offering that time for them to even relax can just be so so important. That's right. Mm -hmm. And sometimes some of them fall asleep, mm -hmm. and they go into a deep sleep. Mm -hmm. And 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 of course, as many people do, and then they snore, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and they go, and when that happens, right, I let them do that. Mm -hmm. You know, I've been to sound baths where people say, don't fall asleep. And if you do, they go and they wake you up. And I'm like, what are you doing? You know, <laughs> you know if people do that, I feel that's what they need. Mm -hmm. I feel I feel your body pretty much gives you what you need in that way. So everything I do, though, now is, is guided a lot by the research that I'm doing. And the understanding of what it is that I'm doing um, on a deeper level um, than just, you know, the, the subjective experience. You know, I know that I'm targeting specific areas of the body. Or I'm, I'm targeting specific aspects of the nervous system. Um, and uh, so it's it's specific to, to what I want to achieve. And, and usually I, I would say, you know, that um, if you would ask me, I would say that the the number one, the most important um, use uh, of sound, right, um, in practice, is essentially to um, activate, uh, to to help balance rather, not activate, to help balance the autonomic nervous system, mm -hmm. in order to promote, you know, the individual's ability to quiet the mind and to enter a meditative state. Because I think it's in, when you're in that state, that's what we know is, uh, can be quite healing for the person. And let's remember that when we're talking about healing, we're not talking about curing. There's a difference between, a, you know, curing and healing. In curing, which is what most of medical practice is concerned, right? You have a specific problem that you want to get rid of. But in healing, we're trying to bring balance to the whole system. So I've worked a lot with patients that are dying, and and in that job, I'm not trying to cure their cancer or stop them from dying, but I'm trying to get them to create balance within themselves in that moment so that they can prepare themselves for this, as well as, you know, their loved ones, you know, and turn th their death into actually something that's therapeutic for them and helpful for for the people who love them, you know, that are left behind. Mm. So I see the, the main target, this is one statement that I've, that I've made that, that I'm not aware that that many people have made it, you know, before me. And I always say that the main target of therapeutic sound uh, practices is the nervous system. Mm -hmm. That's what we're trying to get at. We're, we're trying to alter you know, uh, nervous activity, specifically autonomic nervous activity. But, you know, also remember that, you know, the sound affects the central nervous system. Our entire brain and nervous system is designed to respond to sound in that way. So that's the, the target. That, that's what we're trying to do with this. Uh, with the sound, and I'm very, very focused, you know, on that specific 
aspect of it. Mm-hmm. And how do you research that? How do you get data for how the nervous system is reacting to sounds? Well, that's that's what I've been uh, researching for many yeah. years <laughs> you know, and looking at. So I so if we look first, you know, from an evolutionary point of view, I've done a lot of research on the evolution of nervous systems and and the evolution of the hearing apparatus. Um, and tracing from the earliest organisms. So I've, I've done a lot of work on looking at the earliest, you know, it took at, at the earliest organisms that we have. It took basically about a billion years after the earth was formed for the first life forms to appear in the planet, which are called prokaryotes, right? And these are simple biological unicellular organisms that don't yet, they're called prokaryotes because they don't yet have genetic material and they don't yet um, have a, a nervous system. They don't have organized genetic material or a nervous system. Yet these simple organisms already had a sensorium, which means that they're, they're able to sense what's going on in the environment a motorium, which means they have organelles that are used to move themselves and they have the ability to store information right, and to get it back, which means memory. Mm-hmm. Now, all that is quite remarkable yeah. when you're looking at you know, these simple organisms. You know, that's really quite remarkable. And it speaks to their ability to sense to me, speaks to consciousness. And that's the big kahuna here because from my point of view, what what the healing agent, what makes sound work is our consciousness. So I make the point to people, sound does not heal. And a lot of people, that's the question that they ask, how does sound heal? What's the basis for it, right? Um, especially people who are scientifically minded, right? Who kind of frown upon these things. And I always say sound doesn't heal. The only thing that heals, right, is our consciousness. Mm. All healing. Healing is a manifestation of our nature, not as human beings, but as living organisms. All living organisms have a way of repairing themselves. From the earliest, simplest organisms, right, they have a way of of sensing the environment, reacting to it, and repairing themselves, right? So therefore, healing is part right, of the essence of what it means to be a living organism. Mm-hmm. So all healing occurs within the individual. There is nothing outside of us that heals us. It all occurs, you know. External things obviously can influence the healing process, right? Mm-hmm. You can either help it, right? Or you can retard it in that way. Sort of like when you have a wound, right? You can keep picking the scab, Mm -hmm, right? mm -hmm. And opening it up again, like when you're a kid, you can't help, you know, then it takes longer for it to go away, right? So what we do, our behaviors and all that and external factors can influence the course of the healing process, but it doesn't create it. So sound is nothing more than a tool right, to help the healing process in that way, and specifically, right, to affect our nervous system. And our nervous system is designed to respond to sound. Beginning, you know, when you look at the ear, the inner ear, from the ear all the way up to the central nervous system, to the auditory cortex, right, that whole pathway is lined with cells that are designed to fire at specific frequencies and specific frequencies only. That's called tonotopic organization, right? So only 30 hertz will get that, that neuron, right, to, to get activated, to fire. You know, anything else has not, no effect. So it's designed, you know, for that. And that's just in the inner ear. In addition to that, we have 10 cranial nerves. Right. And the vagus nerve, right, it's 
the most important part, sympathetic and the longest nerve in, in the body is one of those cranial nerves. Right? Well, four out of the 10 cranial nerves have actually branches that go out into the tympanic membrane or to, you know, allied uh, structures. So the facial nerve, the trigeminal nerve, the vagus nerve, and the glossopharyngeal nerve, right, all have little branches, right, that go there to process sound. That means that sound affects the functioning of all of these nerves, right? And the most important one for us in terms of what we're doing is the vagus nerve. Mm -hmm. Because the, the vagus nerve comes out, out of the, the head, close to where the ear is, and then comes down into the neck, the chest, and then the abdomen, and it innervates every single organ in the body, starting in the neck, you know, where you have um, the, the thyroid gland, right? Then in the chest, the heart and lungs, and all the organs, you know, in, in the abdomen, that nerve innervates all of them. But before it, it enters into the neck, before, right? It sends out a little branch, right, um, which is called a, uh, an auricular branch that goes right to the tympanic membrane. Mm. So every sound that affects us through our ears in the tympanic membrane sends that information to the vagus nerve, which is why, for example, if you're walking in the street and you hear a loud sound like, like a crash, right, you go... <laughs> Yeah. You know, your heart kind of jumps and you feel it in your stomach, right? Mm -hmm. yeah, that's all that information being given to the vagus nerve, which then affects those organs in, in that way, right? So in addition to that, right, sound is a part of the trigeminal nerve, right? And the facial nerve. And these are the nerves that control uh, facial expression, speech, right? and hearing, right? So... It's totally related, and, and this is a theory, you know, there, there's a neurophysiologist called Stephen Porges, right, that has a, a theory called the polyvagal theory, mm -hmm. and, and he talks about how, you know, the vagus nerve forms part of a social interaction system, right, because all of these, like the facial nerve, the facial expression, speech, intonation, all of that right, are the basis of human communication. Right? So sound plays a role in all of that. Mm. Yeah. So as you can see, I mean, it, it gets to, and, and, and now if we talk about communication, of course, right, we're using sound, right? That's what language is, right? Mm -hmm. We take a sound, we, we create a symbol, right, that we pair with it, right? And we attach a meaning to, to that, and that's what language is. And that's how we communicate, right? So when we talk about sound healing also, right, then we're also talking about language, mm -hmm. right? And, and we know that language affects us, you know, the, it moves us in different ways, right? The words, you know. There, there, there's a famous uh, story that um, Sufi Inya Khan, uh, who was an Indian Sufi mystic, who, who spoke a lot about him. He was a classical musician and and he wrote a book and he tells a little story of uh, this guru in India who's talking about the power of words and how powerful they are. And there's one guy in the audience who finally can't take it anymore. He goes, that's just total nonsense. He goes, you know, how could mere words have all this power that you're talking about? That's just nonsense. And the guru stands up and says, what? How dare you, you know, tell me that. I'm the guru here. I'm the one who knows what I'm talking about. You don't know anything. Mm -hmm. You're just an ignorant fool and all that, right? And as he's telling him this, the guy starts getting really, really upset mm -hmm. and really angry. And then the guru stops and just looks at him and says, you look upset. Mm -hmm. He says, yes, he goes, I thought you said words had no power. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> So that illustrates it beautifully, you know. Mm -hmm. So when I'm looking at at sound, I'm not just looking at, you know, something you hit and then you, you respond to it. I see that our whole nervous system is designed for that, right? Mm -hmm. And as we go from the ear, right, all, all the way to the auditory cortex, right, then we see that, that the auditory cortex has connections, right, that, 
you know, with a lot of other structures, you know, pretty much affects the whole brain in, in one way or another. Right? But it has specific connections with, with the limbic system, which controls emotions um, in our bodies. And, and so, so sound is, is at the center of everything. Now, in addition to that, you know, this is just looking at how sound affects us as organisms, right? And I, I started to speak earlier about the evolution, you know, the hearing apparatus and all that, and seeing that right from the beginning, sound and vibration. By the way, we're talking about sound, but we're really talking about is vibration, right? Sound is just a specific range of the vibratory field, right? So vibration is one of the basic elements in the universe. And everything is the universe is affected by that in one way or another, right? including us, right? You know, but specifically, you know, you know with, with sound, we see that we're designed, you know, to respond to it, you know, and, and so and so is all of nature, you know. So in my research, you know, I've been looking a lot into uh, the Big Bang, uh, quantum physics, um, and the relationship, you know, between sound and vibration and consciousness, um, not only in living organisms, but also just in matter and nature in general you know i'm sure you you know what sim, uh, science of cymatics is oh yes mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. and that's and that's an illustration of the effect that that sound and vibration has on on matter it basically has an, uh, a design and an organizing effect on matter sound organizes matter into the shapes that we see everywhere it is the underlying vibratory field that gives matter structure and form right so so on a much more fundamental level than even just living organisms right sound and vibration plays a, a, a major role uh, in all of existence it's one of the fundamental forces of nature you know and i and i would say also that consciousness is another one of those but that's controversial you know that's that's a different topic, you know, more complex to get into, you know, there's a lot of different uh, thoughts about, about the subject matter. So we are creatures that are essentially uh, sonic in nature and, and design evolutionarily uh, to respond to sound and vibration in that way. And what makes it healing or not is our consciousness. And to illustrate that, you know, there's some patients, for example, right, that I, I could do a session on them. And could you ask me earlier to speak about some success? So let me address that now, you know. Mm -hmm. So there's some patients that I could do a session on them, and they come out, wow, that was amazing, Doc. I love it. Oh, I feel so great. Wow, thank you, thank you. And they walk out, and as soon as they walk out of the door, and they walk out into the street, it's pretty much gone. Mm -hmm. the, the, the effect yeah. you know you're, you're back to your tough New York you know I live in New York City in Manhattan mm -hmm. right <laughs> you know um, you're back to the tough New York yeah get out of my way you know mm -hmm. you know, walking around you know in the streets there are other people that I have done work on that experience a complete transformation in their lives so needless to say I don't give myself the credit for that. Mm. They, they try to give me the credit. Doc, what you did, I said, no, it's what you're doing. I'm not doing anything. I'm just a conduit here. You know, and likewise, when, you know, when I do a sound uh, a session on somebody and eh, that's nice, yeah, and it feels nothing. I don't like, like criticize myself like, damn, man, mm -hmm. you know, you're not good at this. You don't know what you're doing, right. you know, in that way. It's the person that does it and it's their consciousness, you know. So, you know, I like to give this story a lot of this patient that I had who was an, a woman from Ecuador, an immigrant, an illegal immigrant who was working here. And she used to work um, cleaning houses. And she was a Mormon. Right? And I treated her, I first started treating her, um, you know, there was a point where I, there was a therapist who was a Mormon who who's Dominican like myself. I'm originally from the Dominican Republic. I came to New York when I was 10 years old and I've lived most of my life here. And and she she came to me um, 
sent by this therapist and I started treating her. And she was really depressed and in bad shape and very a lot of insecurity, you know. And at one point, you know, the Mormon church decided that they weren't going to pay for her treatments anymore. And I just couldn't abandon her and, and tell her, okay, we're done. You know, mm-hmm. So I kept treating her, you know, for free for herself because at that point I was committed to, you know, helping her. And I had been treating her for about two years. And one day as she's walking out, out of a session, she says to me, hey, Doc, you know, what are all these things you have here? She was pointing to the bowls and all that. I said, oh, those are the sinking bowls. You know, I, I use it on some on some people and she said to me well how come you haven't used it on me I like sound <laughs> <laughs> and I said oh okay the next session you know the next time you come we'll do a session right and the reason why I had never thought of I never even introduced that to her is because I didn't think she would get into it mm-hmm. plus also you know I was raised by the way my mother was a minister mm. a Pentecostal minister mm-hmm. Um, and I was raised in a Christian fundamentalist home. <laughs> and so I'm, I'm very familiar, you know, with how they think right. about things, you know. And I, and I also thought that she would think, no, nah, that's like some weird Eastern stuff. Like, you know, no, 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 I'm not getting into that, you know. I have people in my family who feel that way. Mm-hmm. If I try to get them to do yoga or something, like, mm, no, no, that's, you know, that's like another religion, like, you know. So, and she was like a peasant woman. No education really and had never heard about sound healing or anything like that something that was totally alien to her so i just assumed that she wouldn't get into that so i said okay so she came back to me right and in the next uh session uh i just realized i left my coffee <laughs> yeah in the, the the next session she came and and i and i did a session on her it was a somewhat, you know, I'd have to say, you know, it wasn't like a particular, you know, there was nothing that really that stood out about her. I, I did a simple thing with her. I actually, I laid her out. I put um, uh, singing bowls around her and I played them and I instructed her to do some breathing. Um, and then I put a, a tuning fork in her in her heart chakra mm. or the sternum. Mm-hmm. <laughs> right. And uh, and then we finished and said she left. Okay. That's it. Yeah. And she came back a month later. I was seeing her once a month at that time. And when she came back a month later, she walked in and she said, and she said to me, she goes, Doc, what the hell did you do to me? <laughs> I said, what do you mean? She goes, what? She said, I don't know what's going on. Or my family either. He says, but since I left here, you know, on that day, after that session, I've been feeling like I'm walking on air. Mm. My depression has lifted. She says, I don't feel anxious anymore. I'm sleeping through the night. I stopped taking sleeping pills. Mm. She goes... And now my family's worried about me. <laughs> <laughs> to me, that was the best part of the statement <laughs> because, because the families are used to seeing her feeling <laughs> bad, anxious, nervous, worried, you know, mm-hmm. not sleeping, and also with pains and aches all over her body all the time, you know. Mm-hmm. She's, uh, we we'll call that somatization, where people take emotional stuff and it, it gets translated into physical pain in the body. Right. And she said, and, and I don't feel in pain. She goes, what's going on? What did you do to me? You know, and I said to her, well, what I did to you was, was to lay you out and play <laughs> the sounds mm-hmm. and have you breathe. You know, the real question is, is what have you done? Mm. You know, but that, obviously that wasn't the right question for her because, <laughs> you know, <laughs> intellectually, I think she missed it, that part, you know, mm-hmm. in that, you know. Um, so she kept, she came to me for about another three months and like three other sessions. And every time she came out, we'd do a sound healing session. And then after about, uh, four months, right, she came in one day, she goes, doc, you know, she goes, 
I love coming here. I love seeing you. You've helped me so much. I really enjoy doing the sessions, but now I'm feeling guilty. She goes, because I've been feeling well. I'm not, I stopped taking all the medications that you've given me. And now I feel like I'm just coming here for the pleasure of it. <laughs> and I'm feeling a little guilty because I know this is your business and you're treating me for free. And I feel like I'm taking advantage of it, of you, you know, in that way. So I think, you know, if it's okay with you, I'm going to stop, you know, coming. Um, and I said to her, okay, then our work here is done. And, you know, if, if you ever feel you relapse or anything happens, you know, feel free to call me back, you know, and we could, you know, do some more work. You know, that was about eight years ago. Mm. And I haven't heard from her since. Mm. You know. So I asked myself, what happened there? Right. And I never, by the way, told myself, wow, look at what I did. You know, look at me. What a good doctor I am. You, right. know? Right. you know, I'm so great, man. I'm a healer. I healed her. No. You know, what happened there is that her con her consciousness was transformed. You know, now I have to say this though. I mean, this almost sounds it's like just that session did it, but you know, we also had two years of work before that. You know, where I was doing therapy with her and you know, working certain issues with her and getting her to see things in a different way. You know, so that was part of that also. That was not somebody who walked in off the street, you know, in that way. You know, and then had that transformation, you know. So that was part of the work, you know. I was working, you know, because my goal in, in my practice always, and I tell people, is to help them to transform their consciousness. It's not to correct chemical imbalances. I don't believe in that. That was always a theory. Mm. And with, with not much really to, you know, to, you know to, to go on, you know. I, I don't believe in that. I think it's about transforming people's consciousness and regenerating brain tissue. Um, that's what I think is the essence of, you know, of what we're trying to, to accomplish here. So I've been working with her on, you know, on those issues for years. And I think that what happened that day is that she had a shift in her consciousness. Mm -hmm. okay. mm -hmm. And, and she was able then to, to use that transformation in her consciousness you know, plus the fact that she also believed in me and she saw me. We had a therapeutic alliance. Right. She saw me as somebody that she, that cared for her and could help her. And she said, I care for her because she saw that I'm not, I'm not taking money from her. You know, there's nothing for me to gain here, you know, economically in, in that way. Um, that way. So that's, you know, that's one of the, my, the best cases that I can tell you mm -hmm. about, you know, and to me, an example of what happens when people transform their consciousness and all of a sudden the world that they're living in and what they're seeing, it's not the same. Right. It's not the same world because it was always a reflection of your, of your consciousness in that way. And so th those are the kind of changes, these transformative changes that I, that I try to go for, mm -hmm. right? And it's incredibly rewarding, you know, um, to do that, you know, um, and to to see those changes in people that you know is worth more than anything else. You know? And also that they initially are thinking it's outside of themselves that you know that somebody's helping fix them, but right. really, you know, they could through their own mindfulness meditation or breathing exercises. But they feel, you know, you're facilitating. That's right. That yes. Yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. So, so the message that all healing occurs within. Mm -hmm. There's nothing outside of you that heals you right. at all. It's something. It's not something that happens to us or that it's done to us. It's a manifestation of our nature, and it all occurs within ourselves, right? And that's what we're trying to work with, you know, to get people to get in touch with that and see that. So. And I, ha by the way, I have the same attitude about medications. Mm. I tell people that the medication doesn't heal you. All we're doing here with the medication is to use them to help to modulate your symptoms. Mm -hmm. 
so that then you can get into the proper state of mind, right? Where this healing can, you know, where this transformation can occur, mm. right? Now, there are certain kinds of disorders that I don't use. I don't, I don't believe that, for example, like in schizophrenia, mm -hmm. you know. No, I don't believe that. There's something there that's wrong, right, in the makeup of the person. And so there my goals are not, I don't expect that anyone is going to do any kind of transformation like I know of sort of not be schizophrenic anymore, right? But I do help those people right, in, in different ways and to learn to deal, you know, with what they have and, and how to address it, you know, when you're hearing... You know, I have one patient that I just saw actually yesterday, um, and he's now, he's a pretty famous documentary filmmaker. He's very, you know, within that field, he's pretty well done. He's done some important work. Um, and this guy hears voices every day. I'm, I'm not sure that he's schizophrenic or not, and nobody knows this. The only one that knows this is his mother and myself, mm. like that. And but this guy, he's amazing. I mean, he's, you know, we do a lot of sound work. We do always meditation. He does it on on his own, um, and he knows. You know, what we've gotten to do with him is he recognizes that these are symptoms, that these are coming from his own mind, that there's no validity to to it. And when the voices are nasty, right, and, 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 and they have what we call command auditory hallucination. I don't know if you've heard that term. Mm -hmm. That's when the voices tell you to do stuff like kill yourself. You're right. worthless. Right. You're nothing. Why are you alive? You know, mm -hmm. or, or things like that. Or, you know, go do something like that. Or, you know, um, he doesn't experience it as something other than inside of him and it's something that's pathological and it's disturbing to him and it's troubling when he's trying to do work and things and then all that or just walking around right but he can put it in the proper perspective right? and when he gets and he was he used to get so anxious you know about it and, and uptight you know now he doesn't now it's kind of like it's more like uh something that's just annoying to him you know, he's totally clear. He's not delusional at all. He knows exactly that these are a phenomena, you know, and he knows that it's a psychiatric phenomena. And he takes medications, obviously, you know. But he tries to keep it at the very lowest dosages, and then every now and then they get so intense he has to raise it, um, raise the medication, uh, which then makes him tired, you know. But my point is, you know, with a person like that, right, I consider my work with him very, very successful. And so does he, right? Because it's been able to put it into the right perspective and to use these techniques to calm himself down and relax himself and focus him, himself when he's having these experiences. Right. You know, so, and, and that's the goal then for him to always, you know, and he never loses sight of that. Mm -hmm. Are you finding other people in mental health care um, are they coming to you? Are, are people curious or wanting to integrate these kind of practices? Is it Are people fairly receptive? Very much so. Yeah. Very much receptive. But, you know, I, th I think, frankly, you know, a lot of it just has to do with me and my personality. Mm -hmm. You know, for them to be receptive of it. In other words, if they trust me, right, then it's easier for them to open themselves up to this possibility mm -hmm. that this thing could work, right? And by the way, I never, ever, ever um, push that on any patient. In fact, what, what I've done now is that I don't say anything to them. When they walk in and they see all these gongs and sinking bowls and water fountains and you know, water fountains, <laughs> and all this stuff, you know, um, eventually they go, what are these things, you know, mm -hmm. you know, or I, I might coax them into it a little bit by, you know, as they're, just before they walk in, I'll, you know, I'll play the ball, and when they walk in, they hear, and they go, oh, that's beautiful. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like a little enticement, like my little seductive, you know, to, but essentially, you know, 
I have to, on the, usually on the very first session, you know, I try to establish a therapeutic alliance with clients. I want them to walk out with the idea that I can help them and that I can be an agent for that. And by the way, if I don't feel that I can help a patient, I will not work with them. I'll ask them to go find somebody else. You know, I'm not just here to try to make a buck. You know, I'm always full. My practice is always full. So I don't have to, you know, <laughs> I won't work with anybody that I don't think I can help. Right. You know, so, so once they feel that, right, then they're open to whatever, you know, I say, hey, you know, let's try this, right? Mm -hmm. And then once they, they try it, they're usually sold. Do you ever have any other doctors or counselors, physicians wanting to learn um, what you're doing? Or I don't know if you do any training programs. Well, I, I do uh, have, you know, I, and I, I do now, you know, most of the training that I do, I do with John mm -hmm. in his retreats. But I also, I'm teaching now, I'm teaching in Europe. You know, uh, next year I'm going to be doing workshops in Spain, uh, in England, uh, Germany, and Switzerland. And uh, I go every year to the Shivananda Ashram in, in the Bahamas, and I do, I spend five days there doing workshops with people and teaching and lecturing. Um, I participate in all of John's events, you know. He, he kind of gets pissed. Not not pissed. He, he doesn't <laughs> like it when I don't when I don't show up. <laughs> you know, it's like, and uh, and now there's a, this little crew there. If I don't show up, they're like, "Hey, what, what's going on? <laughs> Where are you?" You know. So I do do that, but I don't do um, as much as um, as I would like to, frankly, because my you know I'm I'm very busy. Yeah. The, you know. Yeah. I have a full practice. Mm -hmm. You know, I work every day except Fridays when you're actually where I do just my own research. But but I work the, the full days and I spend all days doing that. And then I come home and to read and write and all that, you know. So it's a lot. It's a lot, you know. I don't I don't write, really like to do sound baths that much like in the, you know, in the city now, every day now there's at least four or five sound baths going on mm -hmm. or, or more or more all over the city. It's become such a huge thing. And it's a little disconcerting to me to, to some extent, you know, one, because I, you know, sometimes I go to these things and, and I just see what people are saying. It's just a lot of nonsense. Mm. You know, they just have no clue about what they're talking about and, and they think they are, they do, you know, and they're just going through the motion saying things and, um, and they think that they could just go and lay people out and just hit the gongs for 45 minutes and then they're doing, you know, they're something more significant than that. Um, so I don't really do that that much. You know, if I wanted to, I, you know, I, I could go out there and, and begin, you know, doing sound baths, you know, several times a week, you know, in the city and getting, um, I'm also not a self promoter. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm not really, I've never been like that. Um, and I'm not that interested in doing that because I feel in some ways I'm a little scared of that. You know, I'm a little scared that it's going to take away mm. from, from what I do and the genuineness of it. You know, once mm. you, you know, you promote yourself and you go out there and you create all these things and, and then you create all this narrative about yourself which you know sometimes when i read the narratives people write about it so you could just read through it and see how much bs is behind it you know mm. in in that way so I, i'm not like out there trying to put my name out there doing that you know um i do what i do through my practice i don't i don't make a living doing sound baths and stuff like that or right. you know and even, you know, the teachings that I do in Europe and here, I do it because I love it. And the responses, I mean, it's, it's really great. You know, the people are really into it. Um, I, I like the European audiences a lot. Um, I find them to be a little more educated and sophisticated about it. Um, that's just my experience. I'm not making a statement about that. You know, I see. So... And and I like that. I enjoy that. And, you know, I like to be able to talk about quantum physics and, and the physics of this and the and the neuroscience of it, and people know what you're talking about. Right. 
and you know and dialogue with you you know uh about it you know and i'd like to talk about evolution i mean that's part of my anthropological training you know and the evolution of sound hearing and nervous systems and how we you know i'd like to be able to speak to it at, at that level you know i stay clear out of spiritual things you know when, when i talk about even though I consider myself a spiritual entity, you know, in essence, and, and see my path as a spiritual path, but I don't talk about myself in that way, you know. Um, when I, you know, I talk about yoga or meditation and things like that, just I talk about it from the point of view of the effects, you know, that it has on your psyche and and, and you know and on your ner- on, on your nervous system. Do you think? that's part of what's happening in the sound healing field right now is that people aren't going in depth enough. Maybe they're just skirting the surface and really there's so much disinformation out there. They're not really looking into it for themselves. Correct. Mm. Exactly. I feel that it's, it's, it's spreading tremendously, you know, Yeah. but, but it, you know, but in all fairness, though, it's spreading tremendously in both areas too. There's a mm-hmm. lot of serious people also out there, mm-hmm. you know, that are doing important work and, and, you know, looking at things in an important way. But, but if you go to the events that are out there that most people go to, you know, and you hear what they're saying and what they're talking, it's just, it's like a fad almost. Yeah. You know, that's going on. And I think it's, you know, going on. I think Sylvia said, she told me, I think a couple of years ago, eh, another five years or so, it'll all die. It'll die out. Like, a, <laughs> almost like a, I don't know if you remember Lambada. Hmm. Do you remember that, that dance? I don't the, think so. Mm-mm. No. <laughs> See, that proves the point. Yeah. <laughs> you know? That proves the point. Right. This is the dance that took over the world. <laughs> I, I think it was in the, in the 80s, maybe, yeah. In the 80s, you know, it took over the, the everybody was doing the Lambada, hmm. you know, everywhere, everywhere in the world. But it wasn't a dance that was connected to a culture like merengue or salsa or, you know, or soul music or polka, you know, which is part of a culture. Just somebody came up with this new dance and, and it spread everybody in the world. And then, it, you know, I said, you'll see, it'll just fizzle out. And it did. Sure. You know, and right. the fact that you don't remember it, you know, speaks to that. <laughs> <laughs> like, that I mean, you never heard of it speaks to that. Right. You know, uh, I don't think that's going to happen with sound. No. Because it's so much more, you know, than that. But but the whole craze, I think, with, you know, people going to sound baths and doing stuff like that, I think will be, you know, will subside after a while, I think, yeah. you know. But, yeah. but you know, we'll, you know, we'll, we'll see what, you know what happens with that. Mm. What would you recommend to people that are wanting to go deeper and get a, a more grounded mm. understanding? What I recommend is that because in some ways we're talking about sound, right? But, you know, part of every session that I do entails breathing mm-hmm. and meditation and also aroma. Th- aroma mm. you know i forgot to mention that part i always use aroma in my sessions always i have the aroma going on in my practice and, and my thing is uh, lavender and sweet orange mm, nice. that's my combination you know mm-hmm. and i always have that going in my practice as soon as people walk into my practice go, oh, that begins the process you know because remember all the senses transform you know the biochemistry and and the neural uh, circuitry it's not just sound you know sight also light you know and smells you know so so we integrate so what i recommend you know what i would recommend to people is to uh begin trying to practice some meditative uh techniques even if it's just a few minutes, a lot of people now use apps like, you know, Headspace and that one I use it to the inside timer, you know, to, and to begin also doing breathing exercise and meditative, right? And then to get themselves an instrument, whether it's a singing bowl, 
and practice or tuning forks um, and practicing, you know, on each other. I'm actually, I'm working now on, a, on this program to try to, you know, develop a, a program in a, in a website, which will be a, a tuning fork kit um, with a set of protocols to be used on a daily basis. 10 minute protocols because people's attentions nowadays mm -hmm. are really, really short. Right. You know, for some, I, I tell people that I meditate for one hour every day and some people are like, what? Oh my God, <laughs> really? How could you do that? And I'm like, that's nothing, <laughs> you know? <laughs> that's nothing. Mm -hmm. You know, I put on a timer so I don't go over, you know? Yeah. But for them, it's like, you know, five minutes is like a, an eternity, you know, <laughs> um, in that way. So I'm working on that to try to uh, market that and put that out there. Um, and, and we have also a protocol that I'm, I've developed with my wife for beauty. Mm. <laughs> and that's almost purely commercial. Yeah. Right. <laughs> you, know, <laughs> you know, but using the the tuning fork um, and hitting different acupuncture points mm -hmm. that are designed, you know, to strengthen and revitalize the muscles in the face. Sure. And right. And, and instead of using needles, we're using the tuning fork, you know, in specific acupuncture points. Right. Right. Um, and my wife does that for herself every day. So I said, let's, let's operationalize it, you know, and see, you know. <laughs> um, but, you know, those are things. We, we might never even get them off the ground because neither of us are really driven in that way, you mm -hmm. know, to, to go out there and do that, to make this money and go out, you know. Um, so we'll see. Yeah. Well, uh, how can people find what you're doing? Do you have a website that you keep up? Um. No, I'm working on it. You know, I just, you know, I, I'm working on, on on a website right now. Okay. Um, uh, in that way, after all these years, yeah. Right. <laughs> like I said, I'm not a self promoter. Well, let me know when you do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Let me know when you I, do. I'm working on 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 on, the, on on a website to do. You know, just to I guess to put it out there. You know, I I think you know as I, I'm I'm getting close to retirement now. Mm -hmm to close my practice. I, I think I'm going to do another, probably another four years. Mm -hmm. And then I'm done. And then I'm just going to dedicate my time to travel yeah. uh, all over the world and do workshops like that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and go to nice places and hang out there and work with people right. um, and, and teach others. Um, so I, I don't have that, you know, yet, but I'm, you know, I'm working on that and, um, yeah. If if people are local in New York, they could always come and mm -hmm. and see me, you know, in that way. Otherwise, and they could read about some of the things that that we're writing. And I'm actually I'm also working, by the way. You know, this is has been my latest. And for the last three years, I've been taking um, cymatic images mm. that I find everywhere. Mm -hmm. It's ubiquitous now everywhere in nature mm -hmm. and now i have easily over ten thousand images wow so mm -hmm. and of and my images are of ordinary everyday things mm -hmm. and i'm taking slow motion yeah. videos of the movement of water and things you know mm -hmm. and and i'm writing a book about it because you you're probably familiar with the the two most important books on cymatics, which is the Hans Genuine one mm -hmm. and the and the Lauderwasser book. Did you oh, know sure, that one? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, right. Yeah. Well, I'm hoping that my book will be the third one that will act it and make that a trilogy. Great. Wow. That and and John is the one who pushes is pushing me in that direction. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He's the one who gave me that idea. He says, David, this is the other one because. In those books, right, they're showing the cymatic images that they created. Mm -hmm. What I'm going to show is the cymatic images that are being made by people without any idea of cymatics. Right. And I see them in everywhere, in buildings and things and that and designs and in nature, you know, and plants and trees and flowers on the ground. I have so many. That's so cool. You know, mm -hmm. street, just 
things in the street, you know, in the sidewalk, you know, that I take, you know, um, and and people love them, you know. I, I do have an Instagram uh, page where I publish some of them. Okay. Um, and my Instagram name is Deeper. It's D P E R under hashtag twice. D P E R, and that's is read as Deeper. Okay. Mm-hmm. But stands for David Perez. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <Right>. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and I publish some of them. Some, you know, they, I, yeah, I have like a couple of hundred of them, you know, that I've taken. I, I haven't been that active on it in the last few months. Um, they go through periods where I, I publish more. Mm-hmm. But I, I have so many, you know. That's I have true. these. I, I wish I, I would love to show you these. I, I of these ducks in Central Park. Mm-hmm just kind of standing there like vibrating mm. with their feet underneath and seeing the concentric circles around them. Oh, wow. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Just, you know, <laughs> those images, you know, the ducks, you know, creating their own cymatics, you know. Wow. Yeah. Amazing. So I'm, that's cool. the book that I'm actually working on right now. That and, and the, the second chapter with John mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. To, to, to try to see if I can get that published. Hopefully, I, you know, if I'm not being grandiose, um, I, you know, I, I would like to see it as, as like the trilogy, mm-hmm. the, the third book in that, you know, taking those two books, you know, and hopefully this one, you know, people will see it that way too. That's really exciting. What is, and what was that textbook, uh, integrative medicine for clinicians? Is that the, the textbook is called nutrition and integrative medicine. Okay. A primer, a primer for clinicians. Right, right. Okay. Right. And there's and the it, first one's already out. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's, yeah. yeah that, that one was published last year. It's already gone through two printing mm. right now, and, and there's also an e version of it, okay. an ebook version of it. You know, um, you know, which you, you could buy and read it, you know, online like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, we have, and there are also some really fascinating chapters on that book other people yeah yeah especially the the one on water is really important well great thank you so much for your time and for going into all that you're doing i just think it's just great work that you're doing for for your patients and obviously for yourself and everybody else that's uh, learning with you so thank you so much you're welcome yeah i appreciate it okay thank you for inviting me absolutely okay have a great day Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you so much for tuning into this episode of Sounds Heal Podcast. To listen to previous episodes and keep up to date with what's coming up next, please check out soundshealstudio.com, the YouTube channel Sounds Heal Studio, on Facebook at Sounds Heal Studio, and Instagram, Natalie Brown, Sounds Heal. Be well and stay tuned.